Thank you, John, for being here yeah, today. Yeah, it's my honor. Um, and uh, thank you for, for organizing this conversation with Sean. Um, I don't know if Sean remembers the first time we met, um, because it was, it was uh, 94, so was that 26 years ago? 28 years ago? 28, I think. Not a mathematician. Um, so I just wanted to start, uh, you know, um, when I was looking at questions, um, I, there's a couple of things that I just didn't know consciously, you know, how long John's career has been. Um, I knew that she um, has done, you know, paintings, prints, but also I think her, her work as an activist, as an educator, I guess isn't so far from mine um, in certain ways. I think we both have worked incredibly hard and I told John uh, our first meeting um, was in 1994 and I was working at the Field Museum in Chicago on NAGPRA as a research assistant, which is the Native American Graves Repatriation Act. And um, so I was doing that at the same time as studying painting at the Art Institute of Chicago. And they couldn't have been more different and really uh, frustrating because of it. And you know, anytime when I asked a professor um, about indigenous arts, they had nothing, literally nothing. They had tons on other stuff. And I learned a lot, but in, when it came to how to think about indigenous aesthetics um, and even color theory and everything, there was nothing. So working at the Field Museum was um, really intense because it was really, uh, you know, political. It was really political and um, thinking about the objects as uh, moving the perspective from thinking about them as inanimate to being alive and to being held. So, um, I didn't make that many paintings because I really didn't know how to bring all of this stuff together. I was really confused. It was probably one of the first points of questioning whether I wanted to continue being an artist. And, um, and then one of my colleagues at the Field Museum said, oh, have you heard of this painter, Jean Quick to see Smith? And I hadn't at the time. And so um, he was an installation installer at the gallery at uh, Jan Cicero Gallery in Chicago. And so he called them and he said, yeah, they said you could come over. Jean's there. She's installing her show. So I went over there and she was immediately super friendly, walked me through the works that were on the wall, asked me about myself, um, and then invited me to the opening and the dinner. And I guess probably from that point, sorry, I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> he, he sent this to me and I, I wrote back to him and I said, it brings tears into my eyes for him to tell this story. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, this has been a long journey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But when I, when, I, when I saw Jean's work and her generosity, and then I kind of was researching what you were doing at the time, and um, it just, it just provided a path that I hadn't known about. That was, um, that was real. I could like look at it and I could know that these things happened. And um, it kind of shifted everything. So thank you. It's, that's. That's, that's very kind of you, Jeffrey, but you, know, <laughs> you, you, you had all the wherewithal at that, at that time to you know, move on. That is true. I think, yeah. but I think about, <laughs> no, I'll tell you, one thing that, that when people ask me sometimes is they say, you know, well, well, what do you think, why do you think you've had success? Why do you think you've made it? And things like that. And I, it took me a long time to say, but I finally said, because I'm smart. Yeah. Um, and That's true. And I think I realized that um, what something like your work does, it just means that I don't have to do all of that labor. Like I can start at a different point, like closer yeah. to just being myself, you know, and I think that's what yeah. your career is kind of like a framework for a lot of permission. Well, you know, my career is so way different than all of you young ones. And, um, and, and you know, I come from maybe even more than just the generation before you because um, in your generation you have social media and you know computers came in and gmail and cell phones and 
you know, it, it, it's that, that that's made a huge difference for for all <clears> of you, for Carol Romero, for Nani Chacon, for Raven Chacon, for you, uh, Chinupa, for all all these young people, um, because where I started, my father was a horse trader. He was illiterate. We moved off reservation looking for work. I was born in 1940. My father was born in 1901. If you go back to the history of my reservation in 1901, we were at our lowest ebb. We were starving. The government had taken our land, didn't allow us to hunt and fish and, and harvest food like we were supposed to do. We had all my grandparents and great-grandparents had been rounded up at Fort Missoula. And they signed uh, the Hellgate Treaty, uh, which was just left us just destitute, uh, my family. So when my father was born, you know, life there was terribly bleak. If you read Darcy McNichol's book, The Surrounded, you would see how, how difficult, how, how bleak life was. And so those circumstances that I was born into, uh, my parents weren't married. My mother was Cree. When I was two, she left me with an elderly neighbor and my sister when my dad was working um, as a handyman. Uh, we lived at Nisqually on the Nisqually Reservation. Three families lived in one log cabin with no furniture. And we rolled up in our blankets against the walls so the adults, when they came in drunk at night, wouldn't step on us. Um, my sister and I searched in the daytimes through the garbage piles at the back looking for dried salmon, if we could find any pieces. Um, I mean, all I remember about that time in my life was being hungry and sick, having earaches and uh, sore throats. And um, uh, life was... Uh, life was, I, I would say, was at a very base survival level. Mm -hmm. So when I was eight years old, I went to work for the Nisei who came back from the internment camps as a field hand. And I worked from the age of eight year round for the Nisei farmers as a migrant worker uh, to bring money in with mm -hmm. you know, the horses that my dad took care of and traded. Um, he usually had a garden, so we had that. So. Um, you know, life was very different than it was for your generation. Mm -hmm. In your generation, you had better health and health care. Um, all, all, of, all of you young ones, including my son, all have better bones and teeth than, than, than anything that, that I had at that time. So going from there to here is a long oh, yeah. haul and really was difficult. Yeah. But I think what kept moving me forward was that when I was six, I just knew that you know, crayons and paste mm. and paint in the first grade uh, were just something that uh, just made me so happy. Mm -hmm. And then when I was 13, uh, we rode in the back of a pickup truck into town. The Japanese people took us on Saturday, all, all of us kids that worked in the fields. And I saw Toulouse La Trek. And I came back and, um, and took a piece of cardboard and made myself a pallet with my dad's axle grease. And I had the neighbor take my picture. So uh -huh. I have a little brownie picture of me and on my knees because Toulouse La Trek was short. Um, <laughs> and I thought maybe that would like turn me into an artist if I did that. Uh -huh. And then when I was 16, I sent off for the famous artist course in the matchbook. Uh -huh. And um, my dad let me use my bean picking money for that. And, um, and then I took up smoking because those guys in the famous artist course yeah. all had <laughs> their pictures taken with cigarettes. And I thought if I did those things and I acted like I wanted to dress like a male. Yeah. So, you know, those things had big impact on my art career. Sure. But it, I could see that women couldn't do that. And when I went to junior college, the guy there, the professor, told me that women can't be artists. And so he said I had to like, get out of there and be a teacher or something. Mm -hmm. So it took 20 years of like fighting with universities, raising two babies, and getting myself uh, an um, 
eventually a master's. I had to give up on the MFA because mm -hmm. I spent four years fighting with uh, professors at University of New Mexico who said Indians need to go over to the art ed oh, department. Wow. And you couldn't, you couldn't get a degree here, is what they mm -hmm. told me. Mm -hmm. But I stayed there, and Emmy Whitehorse, yeah. Emmy Whitehorse and I went to school together there. We both suffered through that system together. Uh, she's been my friend ever since uh -huh. um, at that school. In fact, Emmy and Corita and Linda all three of my old girlfriends um, are in the Women of Sweetgrass that I organized in the early 80s. So when you said something oh, yeah. about my having started in 1980, I actually started in New York in the 70s yeah. before I finished graduate school. And that was sort of maybe the impetus for them to let me into graduate school. Uh -huh. uh, because I started with... Um, uh, well, I met Susie Kreil. She came to New Mexico and bought some work with Jules Pfeiffer. It's always like connections. Mm -hmm. you, you, you never do this by yourself. It's always like somebody you know, somebody you met, you know, who you know, takes a shine to you and then you know, they mention it to somebody else. So Susie Kreil and Jules Pfeiffer, who was her boyfriend at that time, um, left a message at the gallery and said, you know, if you come to New York, uh, she said, I'll introduce you to Droll Colbert and Jill Cornbley. So in 1978, I was in an exhibit with Droll Colbert um, and, um, and then joined the Cornbley Gallery in New mm -hmm. York, which was an old staid uh, gallery like Betty Parsons. Mm -hmm. So it started there. Um, then a little, a little article in Vogue magazine in about 1979, oh, wow. um, which, was, uh, which was nice. Uh, but I wouldn't say that it took off like your career, because your career took off like, like, like a jet, you know, <laughs> from the spaceport down here. <laughs> like a, I mean, you've been a shooting rocket. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, 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 one of the things that I've thought about, well, I've thought about artist biographies for a long time because I grew up reading them and, and thinking that's, a, like we're saying, kind of what I wanted my life to look like. Um, and, um, but I think the idea of someone who's had a, a you know, 40, four decade, five decade career, it's like that you've seen these, these changes like in society, in the art world and how we think about artists and stuff like that. And I think I just, I always, right now, I think about how the work I make relates to the time that I live in. So I was thinking, you know, you started, the resume on your, on your website says 76 and 78 for uh, your first solo yeah. exhibitions. And yeah. so, um, so I was just thinking that, you know, that wasn't, you, you would have been like a, an adult during the civil rights movement, yeah. during the feminist movement. Yeah. And I've never heard you t speak about how, what was happening at that time culturally was finding its way into the work and kind of what you were thinking about. You know, the feminist movement was really a white woman's mu movement. Mm -hmm. And so many of us that, you know, participated, we did on the fringes. We were always on the margin. And somebody in New York asked me about that, and I said, you know, uh, we r really weren't invited to participate. And I remember uh, Faith Ringgold talked to me about that mm -hmm. as well, although she did. But it, it wasn't that, it, wa it wasn't that you're, you're you're part of the movement. Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, there were only 12 women, and they were the ones who you know, uh, founded the magazine. Um, can't think of the name of it. But, um, so Harmony and Lucy, and yeah. you know. But I became acquainted with them because um, at that time I was taking exhibitions to Peter in New York to the Indian Community House mm -hmm. from here because I started the Great Canyon Group right. in 1976. And um, and uh, uh, just because it was so difficult, there were no native, especially not native women, mm -hmm. men. The, the white owners of the galleries really took to the native men. And the women were in the trading posts. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so when I approached the Clark Benton Gallery in Santa Fe, um, I, I was the first native woman mm -hmm. in Santa Fe to be in a mainstream gallery that had... Joe Brainerd and 
Roy DeForest and Pat Steer, mm -hmm. Susan Rothenberg. Hmm. You know, I barely knew who they were. I mean, looking back on it, it's kind of astonishing that he took my work into the gallery. So um, was that in the seventies? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was. Yeah, which was actually qu that was quite amazing. Do you know where that work is? The work that I did. Like in the shows. Um. Uh, well, I have a few pieces. Yeah. Oh, uh, good. Of them. That's amazing. Um, and others, others w went into collections, I guess. Yeah. And then yeah. you started showing in Europe in the early '80s. Yeah, that was weird because some of the some of the Germans who yeah. have this fetish, you know, because they have German camps where they camp out and wear wigs and smoke pipes and in the summertime and I forget, I forget what they're called. Yeah, I know. Uh, and um, and uh, so they've got the well. It, it was because of um, the the writer. Um, uh, and what was his name? Karl May. Karl May thank you. Um, that Europeans have this vision of the the savage, the yeah. the raw native in their environment. You know, living in a teepee, and so they started coming from um, German TV stations. I had Finland, Germany, Belgium magazines and and. In the early 80s, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. was really weird, and um, and they came to my studio, and um, you know they would give me directions on how they wanted me to draw or paint for them. Oh wow! Yeah, so I would like a performer. I would have to do what they told me to do, and they made films. I don't even know if I have it. They would be on huh. VCR if I have them, <clears throat> and so some of the galleries in Germany. Uh, uh, Kristen Nutzinger, Dorothy Piper, um, um, who was another one? There was an American in Berlin. Anyway, they um, paid to have work shipped from mm -hmm. this country to Europe. And so I did shows there. And I also, at the same time, would give them names of you know, other artists yeah. here. And so make big group shows over there. Mm -hmm. So we did that in the early 80s. And then that kind of like went away. Mm -hmm. And then what was like the middle 80s like? Because you were showing in New York then? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, it was um, multicultural. Mm -hmm. And the universities were like doing some payback for uh, having ignored us. And so they were making um, departments that were... Um, Native American, Asian American, um, and uh, African American. And they would bring us in for conferences. <clears throat> and I was traveling all the time to, I'd be gone three months out of the year while I was still raising kids. But, you know, my husband was there and um, he was working. So we would trade a car to go to the plane and, and also to make sure one of us was with the kids. And um, at that time, we were being brought into the universities to do these big multicultural conferences. Mm -hmm. It was one of the greatest parts of my life because it connected me to the outside world. Mm -hmm. So here, I had my Native American world here, and then I would go to universities and I would meet Amalia Mesa Baines and Margo Machida and Lucy and um, Mildred Howard and uh, mm -hmm. Howardina Pendell, you know, it connected me to the greater world of color. And I remember mm -hmm. the writer Jean Fisher saying, it was a flop. Uh, the multicultural movement was a waste of time, a waste of money. It didn't do anything. And it did great things for me. It connected me to universities all over this country. I had more jobs than, uh, so if my work didn't sell, which it didn't, um, you know, it would just come home and I would leave it in the crate or the whatever they packed it in. And so when the Joan Mitchell Foundation came around in the uh, early 2000 and gave me a grant to archive my work, I had 
at least eight big tables in my studio. The whole big section of my studio was taken up, and all I had were crates and portfolios that I never opened. Wow. So we, you know, with my son Neil's help, we hired some people and photographed and documented um, 3,800 pieces of work out of those crates. And, um, you know, it was... Uh, um, that that whole thing was not a flop to me yeah. because I was working all the time and I was like going to universities yeah. and doing monoprint workshops, um, you know, meeting with students. Um, it was I, you know, I can't say enough yeah. about how connected I was to the mainstream art world of color, not the mainstream mm -hmm. art world. Mm -hmm but the marginalized mm -hmm. art world. Yeah, that's a, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Um, and then just because it's a, it's a place where it's like a, a history that I return to is sort of the late 80s and early 90s, partially because I graduated high school in 1990, and I had come out um, as gay by that point to friends and myself. And so I remember going to nightclubs, to gay nightclubs, and the issue of AIDS and right. the AIDS um, crisis, I didn't connect it until I was in my probably late 30s yeah. that I realized that going to these clubs, I was in this space with this whole other history that I was kind of like slightly tethered to, but also different. Um, but I was wondering, does that show up in your work at all, the AIDS crisis, or anything in particular about the late 80s and early 90s? You know, it was it was there everywhere everywhere we went. Yeah, it was. Um, a part of conversation because it wasn't just for men; it was for women too. Mm -hmm. And because I wasn't dating, I was married. Um, you know, it made my life different. But I had to worry about my kids. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, yeah, so uh, it, it's a fact of life that you live with. Mm -hmm. It's it's no, it's not in my work. Um, when when you ask me something about what you know what was in my work. You know, I was, and I was making abstract paintings um, because we had to do mark making, they mm -hmm. called it, uh, when I was trained in a formal way at university. And if we put any kind of a figure or pictographs or anything in there, they would ball us out. I can remember Emmy and I were in this class together, and um, uh, Von Buidosh was his name, and he was like, I think he said he was a count or something. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. And um, I remember he, I remember he bawled Emmy out. I think we were, we were making abstract paintings, um, and then he said, and then he made a joke and said, um, "Well, I'll probably see you girls in New York before I'm there." Yes, no. <laughs> Emmy's in New York, I'm in New York, and Von Buidash isn't there. Uh, yes, so, um, so Emmy and I, could, we can laugh about that now, but at the time it was demeaning in the, in the class. But yeah, we had to do mark making. That yeah. was the, the, that's what you had to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's an, well, one of the questions that I sent to you was about how I think for a lot of indigenous Native artists, our work is always about our biographies. Yeah. And so rarely do we get to the point of just talking about how do you use paint, how do you draw, right. your material choices and stuff. And I was, when I was looking at your work, you still have some of the same marks. Like yep. they've been with you for like decades. Yeah. And so it's more like, like I, I, I did want to ask you how you feel about drips because uh -huh. you, I feel like there's a period where it's like, and also because I'm a painter and so I think about these things. But like how you choose to let the drip do what it's going to do, or because you can control it to some degree, right. and some of it you build up so many thin washed layers yeah. that it starts to almost make what's behind it disappear. Yeah. But it's just like a tiny ghost of it because you're using all of these thin thin washes. Yeah. Well, you know when we were when we were studying art at that time, we didn't have a lot to choose from in terms of uh, role models because there weren't a lot of women. Right. So Joan Mitchell was one who had mm -hmm. lots of drippy paint in her work. And I used to stand with a book like this and my paintbrush oh, no like this. And I would follow, oops, oops, sorry. 
I would follow her um, paint strokes in uh, out of the book, and um, you know, and I did that somewhat with Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg too, because they were the they were the kingpins of the art world at that time, yeah. and um, that's what we had for role models. But I can remember when I first saw George Longfish's work, I went yeah. nuts for his yeah. work, and. Um, and I think George and I kind of traded stuff back and forth um, for quite a while. Frank Day's work, um, um, I think that was his name, in California. I was crazy about his work. Um, and, and the truth is that almost everything, when I would go into a museum, uh, like going into MoMA or the Whitney, you know, I would just like take everything in it was like my son was saying to me, Mom, you were so hungry for this stuff. Yeah. You had to wait so long for it. It took you 20 years to get through college. He said, and the way you started out in life, you didn't have parents who took you to a museum. I, didn't, I wasn't inside of a museum until I was in my 20s. Um, you know, I hadn't been in a real library, just the bookmobile that came mm -hmm. uh, to the rural place where I lived. So... Um, I was so far behind the eight ball. When mm -hmm. you say I was mm -hmm. grown, I was grown, but I wasn't uh, yeah. like, I wasn't worldly in any sense. And so I had to like do a lot to make up for time. So when I would go to New York, I would just like go into these museums and just like be in ecstasy. Yeah. You could say, you could say it was almost a sexual experience because yeah. I couldn't get enough, yeah. and it was, <laughs> well, it was, that, that um, says something else. But. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, and I kind of, I'm kind of still that way. Yeah. It's like when I go to Europe or China or Cuba or wherever I go, I, I was like, that just any, any art, any, like, you know, the sensation that you get from, all, all of that, you know, yeah. and I'd carry that back with me. So I think about, you know, some of the things that are in my paintings come from all different sources, but the mainstay is always like Salish. Yeah. I mean, those icons are definitely Salish. Yeah. There's no question. Yeah. Uh, everything that's in there uh, comes from my tribe. Mm -hmm. And then for all of the 90s into 2000, um, Neil and I would go home, and uh, my cousin was married to Blackfeet, and we would go every summer to the encampments and um, to the Okan, the medicine lodge. And um, that was a real learning ground for me mm -hmm. um, about, um, you know, uh, tribal view of the world and the holistic view of nature. And the cyclical way it mm -hmm. works and all of that started coming into my work mm -hmm. and it's there now and I, I would I just talked to a writer at the New York Times and who'd, who'd been in Japan and I asked him were they mostly Buddhist and um, he said no he said there it's really animism and he's clinket and I said Joshua do you think Joshua Hunt is his name mm -hmm. he writes for the Times I said, do you think that, um, do you think that's what we are? He said, yeah, I think mm -hmm. that's what we are. Mm -hmm. Because the way we view the world, and I was just reading uh, this week uh, about the Amazon River being considered a person. Yeah. And I'm saying, why is that so hard? Yeah. What makes it yeah. so hard to not understand that? Yeah. That that's, that's really the way indigenous and native people view yeah. the world it's it's that all of yeah. all of nature and that's how i see it yeah no I, I i agree and i when when i started i guess that has just started entering into my work um in a conscious way and i was i describe it as like kind of these truths that once you accept and realize them you can't walk back from them right it's a different kind of accountability because right. it's like you know it to be true somehow. But, um, well, and then I also wanted to talk to you because the, then you were making a lot of work and what seemed to be a little, maybe a little bit more confrontational and political um, around the Kent Centenary, yeah. um, 92. Yeah. A lot of work between 92 and 96. Yes. 
And um, I, I mean, I feel like, let's see, I, I did, I was in Europe at that time. I had gone to grad school. And I remember in the US, identity politics uh, was beginning to feel really, you know, people were angry. And, um, and so when I left, I was able to kind of not be here. It, by the time I came back, it had kind of calmed down a bit. But yeah. can you talk about that time period? Yes, well, you know, um, <clears throat> they, uh, they, I think it was George H.W. Bush um, who made a decree that the NEH and the NEA were not going to give money mm -hmm. to any political um, exhibitions at all. And like, you know, I was calling people and asking people, um, you know, are, are you going to put together an exhibition uh, with Native people? And... Um, you know, is there going to be anything political? And they said, we can't get a grant. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I decided that I would have to do something about it. And so I started like calling Robert Houle in Canada, mm -hmm. in Greg Statz, um, Faith Heavy Shield, and to see would they work together and would they create something for me? Uh, for this exhibition mm -hmm. that I didn't have any money for. And um, so I found out that, that I could write a grant to the, um, get Alice Sadongi to um, um, take it over to the Phoenix Arts Council mm -hmm. and that uh, they would process it and send it to the NEA for me. So I knew that a woman named Jacqueline Peterson in Eastern Washington um, it, um, uh, was, um, putting together an exhibition that she had already gotten $100,000 for. And it was to show uh, how welcoming my tribe and other Plateau tribes were uh, to the white invaders. And, um, you know, I hate that word settlers. I don't know about you, but you know, that yeah. just sounds like nice people. Yeah. And, and, yeah. you know, and, you know, and it they started in Canada yeah. or Australia, and they use yeah. it all the time. And the anthropologists are just like, you know, they're... I, I hate that word um, because that's not what they were. Yeah. And they were committing genocide anyway. Um, so, yeah, she got 100000 to show we were the happy natives and how we welcomed them. And um, so it's called Sacred Encounters, which uh, sort of riled me that title as yeah. well. So I made this, um, I was actually sitting on my cousin's living room floor at home and we had just done a, I had helped the Stewart sisters. We got some coal tax money for Miaka, which was um, the Montana Indian Artists Contemporary Arts, mm -hmm. that long title. <laughs> gotten, we, we'd gotten this grant. So what I wanted to do with it was to have a big um, conference there and do it outdoors because uh, Native people weren't known to be doing any kind of like Robert Smithson kind right, of stuff. Right. And I always thought, yeah, I wonder if we would do that, would we do it better? Mm -hmm. and, or, or would we be too scared to do that or mm -hmm. whatever? You know, so we got Neil Parsons and Bentley Spang was just a kid. And oh, we wow. got a whole, and, and I asked James Luna if he would come there with me and I would feed him and take care of him. And um, yeah, so Vic Charlo, who's our our Salish poet, he would read to us at lunchtime, and I got my cousin to let us use the cafeteria um, so we could eat meals together, so we could all be together, because that's a tribal thing, we, it means mm -hmm. a lot to us. And so we'd eat breakfast together, and then we'd eat lunch, and then, uh, and we'd eat dinner together. And then everybody went off all over Salish Kootenai campus and, and did things, and Neil Parsons uh, went into town and got fabric and wrapped it around this tree and it had a limb coming out, a little limb. And it was to show that the elders are this part of the tree and that the kids, the young ones, mm -hmm. are this part of the tree, the little limb. Um, and of course, mm -hmm. like in the medicine trees that we have at home, people often wrap calico or fabric or something mm -hmm. to leave it as an offering. I remember Ernie Pepion, uh, who was a quadriplegic and had a nurse, rode in the back of a pickup truck into town and he got big blocks of ice and brought them and made a medicine wheel and, and he put red dye um, 
in the in the top and then when the sun melted it it like spread out over the grass mm. to talk about the fragility of his life of life in wow. general and and that left blood on the grass um, I took a whole group down to the songbird pond and where we planted willows that grew up into trees eventually mm -hmm. in a circle in a big circle and we wove them together um, it was just like, okay, so we're sitting on my cousin's living room floor, <laughs> and uh, James Luna is there, and Corky Claremont, my cousin, and my other cousin, and I'm talking to them about how I wanted to do this show, not sure how I was going to do it. Most of the time, I'm never sure how I'm going to do anything. I just like, okay, that's what I would like to do, and then I look around to see if anybody will help me. Yeah. And usually it's my son is the first person <laughs> that's standing right there. If he's in the way, he gets to help yeah. me. So we, uh, Corky said, let's take the word Columbus and turn it around. And he said, let's be subversive. Turn it around, we'll make it into submullic. So if you take Columbus, and you can make it into submullic. And so I said, and then if you take show and you turn that around, you get woes. So we get, we get submullic show and we get Columbus woes. Okay. That's how we did it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I said, that's really good. Okay, so I got to do something more with that. So then I wrote the grant, and I called Joe Federson, and because we didn't have cell phones then, um, and and so I get these big six hundred dollar, eight hundred dollar phone bills, um, you know, because we didn't have cell phones and we didn't have computers. So I had to do, you know, I had to yeah. use that. Anyway, um, I said, could you work with Elizabeth Woody and you guys make something? Because it was kind of late in the game. So I thought if I put two together, they could, you know, make something. So I think I had 30 people, 34 mm -hmm. maybe, who all joined in. Oh, if I could show that work today, <laughs> yeah. the work that they amazing. did in that show was incredible. Yeah. I mean, I won't go into all the details, but what they, Greg Statz and Robert Hult did in Canada with that guy, Lothar Baumgartner, uh -huh. who had been stealing stuff from the Indians in South America, they snuck into the museum and photographed it and then changed everything that that guy did. It was just like, wow. that's incredible what they did. And so, and I got $12,000. Yeah. That's what they gave me. That's what the government gave me. They gave Jacqueline Peterson 100000 Yeah. They gave me twelve, wow. And I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it work. Yeah. So yeah. I took money out of my own pocket and we made that catalog. Yeah. Is there that a catalog? Like, oh, yeah. Oh, no way. Yes, Who, there is. Can you find them? No. No. I don't <laughs> think so. I mean, I could never print enough like Women yeah. of Sweetgrass. We have a few, maybe one or two, right? Do you have one? You guys have one? You know how much they're going for? $500 on the web. Yeah. <laughs> I used to go on there and buy them and give them away to people. Yeah. And now I, I get, get them for 10 bucks, but now they're 500 Women yeah. of Sweetgrass. And the Samalik is also another one. Yeah. Wow. If I got all these together, I should scan them. Yeah. Because they're really important benchmarks yeah. about stuff we were doing. Yeah. I think that's the thing because, um, I mean, I'm working on a book project and we're trying to think about like indigenous concept in yeah. art. Yeah. And, like, and a lot of those histories just aren't really easy to find at all. They're not and, there. Or the artworks weren't photographed or... No. Yeah. No. It's not there. And if I could, you know, if I could get these scanned, you know, there's the, the new think tank over here at IA. Yeah. You know, the, the one that um, they're working on. Uh, you know, I've s started uh, doing um, interviews with our mm -hmm. elder artists. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my son sets them up on Zoom. And we've, been, we've, we've done eight so far. And I did one with Karita and Linda. Mm -hmm. that they don't like. But, um, <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, everything, every word they say is so important. I, I just, yeah. you know, I just, everything, everything they, they talk about, whatever it is, is so important because we yeah. don't have this history written down. I know. That's what, yeah. we, we need it desperately. Yeah. Or I know, I know, for instance, like with my tribes, uh, Mississippi, Choctaw, and Cherokee, like there's a lot of microfiche documentation, <laughs> and it only exists there. There's only one, and you know, there's just thousands and thousands of films to look through, and yeah. you might find something. And 
yeah, with a lot of university presses, like all of these things were published. Uh, it's just, unless you know about them, it's difficult to find them. We, we want, we, you know what, I want them, I want them in uh, a collective, yeah. like here and up at the Longhouse at Evergreen. Uh, because uh, um, I talk to them and see like if we could make copies of this stuff mm -hmm. and we could put it here and put it up there that we could have two archives mm -hmm. that would be ongoing that people could access it from the web. We need it for our young scholars. Our young yeah. scholars are coming up. Like I try to keep tabs on everybody because I'm always curious. Like, you know, I, I look through CAA roster to see who's mm -hmm. getting a PhD because that says there's a young writer out there. Mm -hmm. If I can get them a job over here with a catalog, like right now, Larissa Nez is just graduating from Brown, and she's, um, she was going to try to go back to Brown, and I encouraged her to go to Berkeley. Um, it would be better for her to have a different mm -hmm. school. But every time I find one of these kids, I try to like stay in contact with them, send them love notes, congratulate them, you know, try to... Um, encourage them if I can find a you know a writing job for them. Yeah. I try to do that uh, because we're 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 at a crossroads here, mm -hmm. as they say in the African American community. You know, Robert's crossroads, um, uh, where we uh, we have scholars coming up, but they don't have the material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They so have we, to start from scratch. They have, they have to start from it scratch. All. Yeah. Okay, so two things. One is we have never had a big blockbuster native exhibition that traveled. Mm -hmm. And so, like, many years ago, the Heard Museum called me because they were going to do some a show of their 10 painters or something. And I said, make a Whitney Biennial and then do it every other year mm -hmm. yeah. and then collect from that. Because I would say from, well, Karita and Linda are walking encyclopedias, these two girls here. And they um, started at IAIA when IAIA first opened. Mm -hmm. They were there before Fritz was there. That's how important they are. Their stories and what they mm -hmm. know uh, is like crucial to me. And like when I did the interview with them and got it recorded, Neil recorded it. Um, you know, it's just so valuable. And so I I want to do more yeah. more of that. You know, um, I'm short of time, but um, but I've been calling the elder artists like um, Larry McNeil, like Joe Federson, Lillian Pitt, um, Elizabeth Woody, uh, all these all over the country. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pete Jemison, oh, Pete is an encyclopedia. Yeah. And we did three interviews, three hour and a half long interviews. We've got all that um, mm. documented. And, but, you know, we could we could do more because he's so important. George Longfish, we did him. Mm -hmm. um, I want to do more of this. We, we did Juanita Espinosa. She's got an incredible story to tell about the work that she's done in Minneapolis in the Native community, and she started that Two Rivers Gallery. I mean, I can just go around the country yeah. and point out people to you who've done amazing things. One, one time I called them hot spots. Because mm -hmm. you could go Janine Antoine, you could go Pete Jemison, you know, and me flying to all these places to stay overnight at their house, mm -hmm. break bread with them, you know, hear their stories. Um, it's, it's like that stuff isn't documented. It's not written down, and we don't uh, have it uh, in any books, mm -hmm. and we need it desperately. Mm -hmm. So um, I can see this, and we need it, you know, in an archive here, so our young scholars can access mm -hmm. it. So we've never had a huge, big blockbuster exhibition, and I'm just mm -hmm. going to say it here mm -hmm. in private to you. <laughs> I'm Sealed. I'm working on it right now. Good. I can't. I can't tell you where. You're going to be part of it. I think I might know something. Yes, you might. <laughs> I, Could be. I have ESP. I Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, but um, yeah, I think that, that that's true. And I think mainly from talking to art historians and museum folks who are studying, that's when I realized the problem that 
they're they're given sort of uh, you know African American Middle Eastern art histories as sort of like comps, but yep. the actual like story of Indigenous arts and histories is like you that's going to take your entire just gathering materials is going to take your entire time there. Yep. So um, well, let's talk about um, closer to now because yeah. well, a couple of things because I know probably for time. Uh, who was it? Was it the National Gallery just collected? your first piece in 2020? Yeah. They didn't have any Native art there, if you yeah. can imagine, the National Gallery of Art. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, this we, we could go around the country. Yeah. I, sometimes when I'm drinking coffee in the morning yeah. and I'm doing like this on the computer, uh -huh. yeah, I, I'm like going, so what's Vassar got? And yeah. I said, no, I do that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty pitiful. So, um, yeah, National Gallery of Art, but, um, what the, did they just they contacted your gallery probably? Um, yeah, I guess that's what they yeah. did. Yeah. yeah, and then, but they didn't buy it. Oh, they did not buy it. Yeah. somebody yeah. else bought it and donated, donated it to it. them. So you know when they like bragged about yeah. you know their their they didn't tell yeah. people like how they got it. So ah, oh, this boy, oh boy, this is. This is, Indian world is so complicated because yeah. it's all tied up with government and bureaucracy mm -hmm. and the BIA and y you name it. I mean, our lives are fraught with our yeah. enrollment numbers and you know, not getting enrollment numbers. And um, it's like way more complicated yeah. than white people live or than any other culture on mm -hmm. this continent. And... Um, you know, our bodies are this land. This land is our bodies. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're really, um, there's nobody else here whose religions come out of this land. And so um, how, what the government has done polluting the land and, and trying to kill us off. Mm -hmm. And still, still, like all these Indian people that are on the border down here, they're Indian people. Yeah. I'm sorry. But, mm -hmm. you know, where we live here, people have a lot of relatives across that border. Yeah. Just like up there, you know, we have a lot of relatives across that border, too. So, oh, boy. Well, this is a, it, it's, it's like, um, then uh, it was interesting that a lot of people called because of that. So I got a call from The Guardian in London yeah. to talk to them about why the <clears throat> National Gallery just purchased a piece of native art. And I, I, I'm talking and I'm saying, uh, oh, well, Leon Polk Smith um, should have been there. Fritz yeah. Schilder should have been there. Uh, you know, Alan Hauser should have been there. And then, uh, oh, and then the National Gallery saw the interview and said, oh, we have a Leon Polk Smith here. Right. <laughs> and, then, and then somebody else says, well, yeah, but he's, he's not enrolled, so he's not recognized. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. When I did the first show with Cornbley in New York, um, you know, Leon Polk Smith came in to see what mm -hmm. I was doing and wrote in the guest book. Every show that I did, he was there. I never got to meet him because he was a shy guy. Mm -hmm. You know, Lorenzo Clayton hung yeah. out with him, you know, because they were gay men. And uh, he was always accepted as Native. Mm -hmm. So... You know, and I understand in those days when he was born Indian Territory, they didn't keep records like, like, mm -hmm. they, like they do now. Mm -hmm. Like the ones that sit out in the rain in the backs of buildings, you know, that, um, that um, Pepion had to um, mm -hmm. rest. Well, you couldn't rescue them, but eventually, uh, remember, she had to uh, yeah. sue the government yeah. for the money. Yeah, so... They claim that records are well kept, yeah. but you no. know, in those no. days, and when I was growing up, all the people who worked in these agencies were all white, mm -hmm. and they were enrolling their kids. <laughs> uh, because Nancy Fields, who was married to the guy that was on the, what was his name? Or, um, Archie Bunker. She was married oh. to Archie Bunker. Mm -hmm. I sat next to her at a dinner in Hollywood one time, mm -hmm. and she bragged to me that she was on the rolls at Crow. And, and, and I said, oh? She said, yeah, my grandfather was a Indian agent there, mm -hmm. like he was white, 
and he enrolled all of his grandkids and all of his children in that land. And, and yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, so that yeah, it's such a you know, crazy so story. when they talk about Jimmy Durham and yeah. Target, you know, people were fleeing the reservations yeah. because they were starving to death, yeah. and they had to get off to go someplace. And you know, and and then relocation, they put Indians in buses and bust them to Minneapolis and San Francisco, and you know, Wilma Men Killer has always talked about that, and dropped them off there. So when you go, like one time, Jeffrey Chapman took me on a ride through the Indian burial in Minneapolis, full of Chippewas or Chippewas, you know, um, Crees, and it goes for ten miles mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. little tiny bungalows, yeah. you know out of work, you know, uh, working at low paying jobs, that sort of thing. You know, it's a real barrio full of drugs and yeah. problems. Yeah, And that's where the government left everybody. Yeah. I feel like I, I always, I mean, I, I met somebody, uh, she was kind of a mentor named uh, Mavis, um, she was Menominee, worked with me at the Field Museum. She taught me beadwork. She taught me how to um, tan hides on her, the rooftop of their co-op in the middle of the city. Oh, interesting. And um, she taught me how to sew. But um, she would tell me this, the bar stories of yeah. like that period when like the bars where people would hang out and like yeah. she'd tell me about who dated, who had kids, who yeah. hooked up. And yeah. like those stories too are so amazing. They're like, they're, and I wish those were collected those are That's the city res. Yeah. And you know what else they yeah. did? In every place that I went, like if there was an Indian community house, but even there it, where all these barrios were aware, uh, you know, where natives collected. And there would always be a bar or there would always be some place yeah. where Indian people would, can, you know, come together. So the Indian Community House in New York was right. one. Uh, but there were also bars where they would come together. And they, they would, um, I remember I was, I was in, in uh, the gallery, the Indian Community House gallery, one night when Floyd Westerman came in. And it wasn't that big. He came in and, and, and played music. Mm -hmm. It was like a, a mini little powwow in there. Mm -hmm. We were all in yep. there together. And I looked out the windows at, at the skyline of New York and thought, you know, they don't even know that we're alive. Yeah. They don't even know we exist. And if we do, you know that movie called The Last Wave um, mm -hmm. that came out of Australia? Mm -hmm. And oh, it's a cult. You've got to see it. 1966. And um, it was black and white. And it was all about the Aborigines coming into the city mm -hmm. or being bussed into the city and looking for jobs. And they're in the underground, like in the sewers, uh, drumming and singing or, you know, having, yeah. Uh, yeah. with the didgeridoo, ha having ceremonies in there. And, um, and this anthropologist was telling another, and they were doing social work for them. And they were saying, you know, they have no culture. Mm -hmm. They don't know who they are. They come in here, they, they've got nothing left. And you remember the trading post at home, the mm -hmm. guy at Four Winds telling me that same thing. Right. You know, your tribe has no culture. You guys don't have anything left. And then he goes on to tell me a story about how we were meeting up at St. Mary's in the summertime for ceremonies, and they wouldn't let him come anymore. Okay. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, like... Like he was, he was, They didn't want him there, mm -hmm. and I can remember being up at the Ocon and seeing like a van full of people mm -hmm. with their cameras out trying to take pictures of us, and all the men going up there and telling them to to beat it, yeah. to get out of there. It's it's not a, not allowed. So when they say that about us, they've done everything. You know, when I go out to audiences and I've got Indian kids in the audience, I say to them, it's a miracle that we're here. It's a miracle. I mean, for me to be here and live through what I did. And for you to be here, because the ancestors, if we didn't have them, we wouldn't be here. They made it uh, possible for us to be here. Because what we've lived through, the genocide that we've lived through, you know, Richard Bell, the Aboriginal painter in Australia, Neil and I met in New York at, a, at an Indian at a conference yeah. in New York. And um, he just had a retrospective, and he's having one at the Tate now, thank God. 
his work, his work, like the stories in his work are yeah. all about us too. And, um, and, and he talks about that living through the genocide, how we got here if we didn't have those ancestors. They didn't have Safeway stores, they didn't have Walgreens, you know, they didn't have mm -hmm. any gas stations, they had none of that. And they kept us alive. I mean, they made it possible for us to be here. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I, always, I always see that we, we are a miracle. If we could only, you know, if our young ones only could see, see that, yeah. that we are. Well, I think, uh, thank you. Um, should we, do we have time for questions? Yeah? Yeah? Does anybody have any questions for either me or Sean? Yeah. Feel like you sound loud. It would be great to have your questions for the recording for people to to listen to afterwards, if that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Any questions? Yeah. Any questions? We never got to the text. We never got to the text. The text. Yeah, because I see some change in your text, and I don't know if I if I'm actually seeing it or I'm just imagining it. Yeah. Yeah. Jean, thank you so very much for br almost bringing us to tears so many times with your deep truth. I'm still pulling it together here. My question is, and it's because I teach at IAIA, it's for my students, what, what are your thoughts as to what artists could be doing in the face of the climate emergency that would matter? That would matter. That could make a difference. Well, thank you. I I see a lot of um, I see a lot of our native artists, uh, you know, referencing climate change. So whether it's about water, because you know water is life. So you've been hearing that everywhere through the native community uh, with Standing Rock and because of Standing Rock, uh, you know. Bring, bringing that into the light. So I see Native artists as, um, like of all the artists across the nation, as actually, um, you know, keeping that, keeping that going, you know, which is what we have to do. Um, uh, repeat it in their work, repeat it in their uh, lectures, in their writing. I see it everywhere in the poetry. Joy Harjo references it and she had a wonderful talk that she gave to the Indian Arts and Crafts in Vancouver. Uh, I love that, that speech, and I've read it a couple of times. Um, really important. So, and of course, her, her words carry a lot of weight, too, with young people. So every young person should read that speech that she wrote. Thank you so, so much, both of you. Um, I'm wondering, this is a question that both of you can answer and probably do have answers to, but um, how do you see that your work is received differently outside of the US in different continents versus here in the US? Is there a different understanding of native art and from your artwork in particular when you've exhibited worldwide? What do you think? Well, I mean, <laughs> I love that you're whispering. We're mic'd. I think uh, I, I haven't actually shown that much in like different contexts. I think you know there's been interest from Germany, from galleries in Germany, but because of the history that Jean mentioned, if I even get a whiff of that, <laughs> what they're interested in, I'm not interested in doing it. So I just I just joined a. Um, uh, gallery in London this past year, so I'll start showing there. But I think they've been spending this year, um, and this is to the credit of the gallery, they've been spending this year working with me to find the language to introduce the work so that I can continue kind of having some control over how people engage with it. I haven't been showing much in other countries, but uh, making prints in print for mm -hmm. portfolios that Melanie Yazzie does, 
they, they go to other countries. Mm -hmm. So it's not like any emphasis on my work, but it's a, a whole group of professors. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing, I, one, and I did write this to Jean too, but I think the language around how people talk about Native American art um, is changing, and, and hopefully some of those writers are going to be Native themselves. Yeah. And writing from that that perspective, and I think, uh, and you know, whether criticism or how criticism emerges out of that language, mm -hmm. I think that's sort of what I hope mm -hmm. is on its way. And I, I know, I know some of it's happening, but it's again, it's that question. You know, the native population is made up of all these micro communities, yeah. and so it's the individuals that decide to like, yeah. you know, leave that leave that border and kind of make connections in a network. And I think the internet has definitely helped with that because there's just a lot more um, native artists that you could look at within 15 minutes, you know, and kind of see how they're cross-referencing each other. But, yeah. Thank you both, um, John and, and Jeffrey. This has been really wonderful. One of the things I want to ask about, and it kind of goes on the question that was just before, is um, a teaching anthology or a art history of Native American art. Um, do either of you uh, have those kinds of resources for young Native students? I know when I was doing my own research, it was really hard to find some sort of uh, text that really gathered all this information. Do you know of, of that being formed, or I, I, is there research being done to sort of collect this history in a place where it's not just on Google? Well, just I, mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the new think tank here. Yeah, that's, IA has a new think tank yeah. here uh, and in Santa Fe. And I was thinking about um, the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective, um, which is still going. And I think that started, my gosh, maybe like maybe 10 years ago or so. But I think anything they've published, any kind of uh, notes from their symposiums that I know that they have, they have archived would be worth it. And also NASA. Um, I think all of the papers that are um, given there. I think Idle Jorg, I think their catalogs have kind of been trying to do this for some time now, and that collection is really interesting. I think, you know, I'm interested in um, more of like the ephemera, like if there was a catalog available from these early exhibitions. I kind of think because like what you did was almost like an exhibition for other Native people, and that audience being different about how much mm -hmm. the audience already knows and understands about Native populations. Right. So when you do a show like that, and you have $12,000 to get all the work together, and then to right. try to do a publication, it's um, the ephemera, I feel like it would still speak to me today, you know, yeah. as a Native artist. And so I, some, I'm kind of, sometimes I want to remove the scholarly kind of interpretation of things mm -hmm. and just let there be a closer thing between young artists and the event itself. Mm -hmm. And maybe sometimes that's ephemera. Now, and I have to say too that a lot of times the, the, the material that's written has been written by white people. And you know, I've not got anything against white people. I'm married to one, but uh, <laughs> um, you, <clears throat> you know, I have to say that um, I really like to hear from uh, the artists themselves, and so like um, recording these, um, you know, these uh, Zoom videos, uh, and hearing, hearing the artists mm -hmm. speak, just like we were here today, you're hearing a story that's not written down, that isn't in any book, uh, and it's like the real deal. I really, I really relish these. I want, I want to hear right from the artists what they're life experiences and what they've been, uh, what they've gone through to get to where they are. Um, that is the real stuff and we need more of that. So any of you who uh, you know, have an artist friend, a native artist friend, can do an interview with them and record it, 
having it recorded and not written by somebody else, I can't tell you how important that yeah. is because yeah. we just don't have that stuff. It's, someday it will be written down, but right now, like I'm saying, we don't have enough stuff. So the fastest way for us to get it is to do these videos. And um, yeah. um, I, I think also like IA, IA, for, for me it would be like the, the best kind of depository for all of that to come to, yeah. which I don't know if anyone here is from IA, but not to put more work on what you're already okay. doing, but it does seem to be like it would be the right place for it to become a, like a research center for people to come. And the Longhouse is a good place yeah. too, the Longhouse yeah. at Evergreen. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, they're interested in that too. digitally is the easiest because it can just get kind of like moved around so quickly. Yes. Yeah. So it can be shared yeah. and, and so scholars can access it. And our young scholars just don't have enough material yeah. to work with right now. Yeah, if you're researching like exhi yeah. 20th century exhibitions, yeah. you're going to find there. stuff starting maybe in the 80s. Yeah. You know, in terms yeah. of catalogs and things. Well, you've got to figure that that when when IAIA began in the early 60s, and Lloyd Kiva knew was there, and he was teaching silkscreen and and uh, fiber and um, you know, and, and they were teaching ceramics. Audley Loloma was teaching ceramics. Um, and then Fritz came in to teach paint. Uh, and Alan Hauser came in to teach sculpture. Prior to that, what they had was kind of what I call lap painting. Uh, Dorothy Dunn watercolors mm -hmm. you know, that you could hold in your lap or, you know, put on the table here. And, um, and they weren't doing etching lithographs you know, mm -hmm. human-sized sculpture, you know, oil painting on a large scale. They started that there, and then, of course, uh, Bacon and other, you know, other schools mm -hmm. started that as well, Haskell. But I would say after J.J. Brody's book, um, at that point in time, stuff really started happening like not just Indians that went to IAIA, but those of us who went to other schools. It was breaking the buckskin ceiling at that point because, because we were making you know, life-size paintings, bigger than life-size, yeah. and we were doing lithography, and we were doing monoprinting and etching, and life-size sculptures, and stonework, I mean, you name it, we were just hitting all of that stuff and stand-up performance. And like when they talk about, oh, it started in the 1980s or 1990s. No, it didn't. No, there were precedents there. <clears throat> if we did a history search and we looked farther back, we would find other mm -hmm. precedents mm -hmm. for uh, natives doing stand-up performance. Because mm -hmm. James Luna didn't invent that, but he was really good at it. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe one last question and then we'll yeah. put up with Tatiana. No, you go ahead. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Hello? Oh, wait. Oh, hi. Yeah, right. We'll come back. Hi. Oh. No, her question is probably more important. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, George. That's not true. <laughs> Steve, right here. I just. Thank you, Jean and Jeffrey, for uh, mentioning II Institute of American Indian Arts. I just want everybody to know uh, it is working. The think tank that they're referring to uh -huh. is the Research Center for Contemporary Native Art. Uh, if you go to the II website, we have launched our online database, um, and we're moving towards um, aggressively making that think tank happen in the in the near future. So uh, I just wanted to acknowledge and thank you both for bringing that up um, because it lives here in Santa Fe. It's going to it's available to all of you and um, and just keep an eye on it. And uh, we'll be, probably be reaching out to both of you as well um, for your work and in contrib contributions to the field. Thank you. That's, that's one of our young painters, George Alexander, studied oh. in Italy. So this is the new generation. He go. studied, he oh, got great. his master's in Italy. <laughs> He's an incredible painter. Uh, um, well, since yeah. that wasn't a question, I guess I can still ask one. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I, my question could go to both of you, but um, Jeffrey, uh, I got acquainted with your work out at uh, the Philbrook out in Tulsa, and it was one of your punching bags. And I, I remember when I saw it, I was wondering how could... 
a painter jump from using the medium that I know to something as conceptual as what you did. And I was wondering, during your beginnings, was there a, sort, a, a certain transition that you, you felt as well? Like, yeah. I mean, those punching bags are amazing, yeah. first of all. I mean, yeah, they're, they're incredible. Uh, yeah, there was. Um, I, uh, I'm trained as a painter, and I identify as a painter. And, um, and I think, really, I was an abstract painter. And so when I would put down brush marks, I was thinking about weaving, I was thinking about basketry, I was thinking about carving, but trying to somehow think about it in paint terms. And I would show the work, and it was always just kind of dismissed as, and, and appreciated, as just kind of colorful and pretty, and, and I wanted these stories to come through. So at some point when I was really frustrated, I decided to stop, like, I was like, what are the, what are the mediators between what I'm trying to say and how I'm saying it? And that's what led me to just be like, if you want to talk about fringe, just use fringe. If you want to talk about reed, just use reed. If you want to talk about vintage blankets, just get the blankets and use the blankets. And to put down books and stop looking at pictures and start kind of being more physical in the world. And um, the punching bags was one of the first things that came out of that shift. And then I didn't get back to painting until probably around 2013 and didn't really start showing painting again until 2018. Well, thank you thank so you. much.